So what I'd like to do formally is get us to the point where we see why uh, closed con convex sets of probabilities may not be sufficient. Once you've opened the door to IP, the question is how far you've got to go for that. Sets of probabilities. Close, well, maybe they don't have to be close with all the about boundary issues. Do they have to be convex? All the examples we've seen so far are convex. Do they have to be convex? I want to argue no, and I want to argue no on basic graphs. But in doing so, we'll look at different decision theories. Is it right, Gerd? I don't think you did any non-convex examples yesterday, did you? Yes, I didn't. No. But you, so going to yeah. Okay. So I said uh, we're pursuing a lot about dominance. And uh, part of what I want to get to is uh, based on dominance. Let's, let's see uh, some tensions that are lurking between Bayes uh, and security and dominance. So I have here a binary decision problem. There are only two states, omega one and omega two, and three acts. So the acts are F, which give value zero in state omega one, but well, pointing to the screen, sorry. Give zero in state omega one, and one in state omega two. G, which is the dual, gives one, zero, one in state. And H, which is constant point four. So these are graphs like the graphs I gave before of the Ellsberg, looking at the ranges and expected utility. You might want to say, keep away from the endpoints. So, okay, fine. So if you want to attend between just the green lines, what's going on between the green lines is good enough for our discussion here. So this would be a lower probability of 0.25 on omega-2 and an upper probability of 0.75 on omega-2. Symmetric around a half, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, if you ask what are the base solutions, that is, what, what acts maximize expected utility when the menu says FGH, what I've graphed up here with the red is the surface of optimal maximizing expected utility solutions for every probability. You pick a probability, we look up the line, we get the ranking by expected utility, and the red is the upper boundary. So what we see is that for every probability, it would be for everyone, but certainly between the green lines, I'm limited to uh, F and G, H is never base. That's the chart. H is never base, has no base model. On the other hand, H is a security maximizer. We're getting back to questions about uh, uh, Ellsberg type thinking. I don't want to be, I don't, I, I like options that don't reflect uh, volatility from the nuisance parameter, which here is the probability of the state. Because uh, uh, F, though uh, never base, is got high security and has higher security. It's lower expected value. It's better than either of the other two, even though it's not base. So the question is, how can we incorporate these? What kind of decision theories are there? There are decision theories that look only at the base part of the story. There are decision theories that look only at the security maximizing part of the story. There are decision theories that try and get a bit of both. Uh, uh, my teacher, my thesis advisor, Isaac Levi, was uh, very, very early on uh, advocating a rule which tried to get both in, but he was uh, enough Bayesian so that the first cut says you limit yourself to base solutions, and then amongst the base solutions, you worry about security as a second tier consideration. So that's a kind of way of compromising. We'll talk about that. But in this case, the base solutions already restrict you to F and G, and you never. Uh, get to H. Isaac calls H in this case a second worst because it's never, it, 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 at every point it's ranking is either second or third. It's never, but it's worst in the following sense. Let me give you a similar picture, which will explain what he means by, because if the second worst, there's got to be second best. What does he mean by second worst? Let me draw the following variant of this picture. And so what you saw here is that F crosses below this point. But I can take another version of F over F prime, where instead of 0.4, it's 0.6 constant. 
Now, binary comparisons don't change anything here between F and call this F prime, uh, but not F, F H prime. H prime, if I do binary comparisons, just binary comparisons between H and F or H and G in a binary comparison, each is Bayes. I mean, what do I mean by that? Throw away the, one of the three options, throw away G. So I'm just looking at F and H in this original picture. Well, they cross, you see when they cross, and um, uh, to one side H is better, and the other side F is better. So the base surfaces in the pairwise choice would have both F and H. Likewise, G and F uh, restricted to those two, both are bays. But when I put them all together, all of a sudden the F and H are both bays and G and F are both bays in pairwise choices. When I do the triple, H is no longer bays. And the, that is not something, so the, but you can change the binary comparisons and have it be bays in the sense that if I put H up here, now my base solutions, I should have not put that, let me put that this in green so that I can, let me change to green because now I want to do the base solutions in red. Now, for now, the base surface picks up some of each, all three are base. And the binary comparisons are not changed between uh, H prime and F, both are base, between uh, H prime and uh, G, both are base. But now in the triple, H prime is base. So you see that what's base does not reduce to binary comparisons. Let me say that again. What's base does not reduce to binary comparisons. Because the story between uh, F and H prime and G and H prime are identical with the story between F and G, F and H, and G and H. So the binary comparisons do not distinguish when uh, H is, when it's H or H prime. And in one case, in the triple H prime is Bayes, and the other case in the triple H is Bayes. So already Bayes is sensitive to context in this way, even though typical Bayes, solution, Bayes theory gives you sort of binary preferences. We know that in this kind of IQ setting, Bayes is displaying non-binary character. And I said, I was Bayes more than even Isaac like. So I say, I don't want decision theory based on binary comparisons. I want decision theory that looks on a structure much richer than binary comparison. I'll talk about that. And the motivation for it is that the binary comparisons in this kind of IP setting is not distinguishing H from H prime. Now, if I were to introduce mixed strategies, the story is different. I'm dealing here with the option space is not convex. I'm not dealing with mixtures of options, just the pure three options. So if I just have these three options, FGH or FGH prime, the binary comparisons look the same, the triple base sort of questions. So this, this is the first, so I'm softening it up. I'm softening up saying, if you want to respect Bayes, don't limit yourself to binary comparisons. So in that sense already, uh, I'm, I'm saying desirability is nice, but I desire more than desirability. Because I want, I want, I mean, this is only because that's the part of the story. But I think uh, third would say that it's reason. I think you would say two. I think you would say yes. Yeah, reasonable to want more than five. Questions? Yes. Can you explain why uh, you are dealing with F, G, and H? F, G, and H. H is never Bayes. That is, if for every probability, I have the menu of three options. I say which. For, you give me a probability. Show me what maximizes expected utility. That's this graph we saw it before. It's like an Ellsberg graph. And no matter what probability you pick, I'm saying if you don't want to worry about extreme ones, stay between the green lines, but it's irrelevant to the story. No matter what you pick, H is never on top. Either F or G is on top. So neither either F or G is a base solution, depending on your probability. H is never base. But pairwise comparison, if you have F and H, each is base. The surface of base now does include the yellow if I only have H and F or H and G. So pairwise comparisons tell you that all three are base in pairwise comparisons, F and G, F and G. Excuse me, F and H, G and H, F and H, F and G. But in the triple, H is not, not 
days, but I can give you the same binary story by replacing H with H prime at 0.6. And now when I have H prime is 0.6, H prime is Bayes in the triple choice because the surface in the middle, the probabilities of the middle favor 0.6. Now, H prime here not only is Bayes, but has the further property that it has the security maximized. And so what we can do is look for strategies that are base and security maximizers at the same time, see how that takes us. But what I'm saying is that if we want at least to have the base solutions available as a first, if we want to identify those, don't limit yourself to pairwise comparisons. But that means we need a decision theory that says we're looking at something more complicated than just pairwise. I give you a menu. What do you need to look at? You need to look at more than pairs. Uh, so we have three same properties. We're not telling jokes by the numbers. So this is exactly what Mark Jay and I did. So uh, you're, you have to Aiden. Aiden, Aiden just told a joke gamma. Gamma is a principle of Armartia Sen about choice functions. So we might as well tell them what alpha and beta are when we tell them gamma. So uh, property alpha. So, so here's Sen, beautiful work by Marty Sen. Marty does always beautiful work. So I have menus and I can ask choice functions allow me to take the a menu and say, these are the allowed choices and these are the disallowed choices. Obviously it's a generalization from, from a binary preference when the menu is two and the preference is saying, I like this one better than that one. The one I don't like is inadmissible and the one I do like is admissible. You're allowed to like them both. But then Property alpha says that if I have uh, a menu and an option is admissible from the menu, then I said, oh, that, 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 different ways of putting it. See, it's a question of whether you like thinking about contraction or expansion. Let me do expansion. So I've got a menu and I've got uh, where should we go to eat? And the menu is restaurants. And we agree that on the set of restaurants we're looking at, restaurant number one is not a winner. We're not going to a restaurant. And someone says, did you know restaurant A is open? That wasn't on our list before. So we add A in. Can, in the presence of restaurant A, can restaurant one be promoted from a loser to winner? Property alpha says no. If it's a loser on a small set, it's a loser on the large set. That's property alpha. Property beta. So that's joke alpha. Alpha is very much related to strict partial orders, which we don't know, because we heard about strict partial orders. Alpha and a little bit of strict partial orders. Um, property beta. Property beta says that if I have two options that are both admissible in some this is some menu, so there are some minor menu that contains the two options, say just the two of them, and they're both admissible, then whenever they're both available, either they're both admissible or they're both inadmissible. I cannot split. What is there? If they're ever both admissible, then they're always either both admissible or neither is. Can't split them. And gamma finally we come to gamma. Gamma is a bit more problem. Gamma is the property that suppose I've got uh, different menus and they're not destroying menus. And there's an option which appears in every one of these small menus. And it's admissible whenever in the small menus. Now, when I take all the menus and combine the brand menu, that option is better be admissible. That's gamma. And now you're right to see why gamma is why what A is pointing to, because the binary choices are small menus and the triple is a bigger menu. And you can have uh, F and H admissible in the both in H admissible in the FH menu. Uh, H admissible in the uh, GH menu, but H not admissible in the triple menu. So there's a violation of gamma. Am I right to think that also, you know, representability is a binary relation, which is why it's actually meant if only if you have alpha and beta. Okay, so there's a question of what does it take to have a, a choice rule that reduces to binary choices? Same calls as normal, alpha and beta. So to say that your choice menu is given by binary choice functions, it's got to be alpha and gamma, which is very good because we will look at some rules which are binary but don't have a whole. That means they're satisfying alpha and gamma. And Bayes is not alpha and gamma. So. 
done this context. Yes, correctly. Not paying attention at the right moment. Is it clear to everybody I tried to say it before. So a base admissible option is an option such that it maximizes expected utility for some probability of the same. And if I have one probability, then it's not a maximized expected. Thank you for asking me if I was wrong. So decision rules that restrict ourselves to base admissible solutions or some subset of them. Will typically not will not be by by binary rules, as we see from this little. That's why I'm thinking this example is far off from what I learned from us. It's just that he didn't go far enough, with it, as far as I'm concerned. He shied away from all the complicated implications of it. Because we'll see out of this, we don't restrict ourselves to convex sets of probabilities. In fact, I'll ring the bell. If you give me this kind of decision rule that limits the base solutions, every set of probabilities is distinguishable by choice theory. No worry about boundaries or connectedness or convexity. Every two sets of probabilities has its own choice pattern and simple finite. So if you go, I mean, all the headings we had about boundaries, about all these questions go away if you move from binary choice, binary preference to choice. That, I'm, I'm advertising, but let me, let me try and convince you of that. So if one of the advantages of expanding to this perspective of decision rules that are not given by binary is that it solves a whole bunch of other problems that are very difficult. Of course, the computational burden of satisfying you, you pay the price somewhere. You pay the price in terms of computation and complexity of decision rules. But they do sell, they say, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about boundaries. They're all, it's all subtle. And, and every two sets of probabilities have this have meaning, empirical behavioral meaning. So it, it really lives up to the IP theory in the sense that two distinct sets of probabilities have different decision patterns. Doesn't matter what they look like. Okay, let's keep moving on. So let me. Let's look at three, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on with three decision rules, which are prominent in the IP literature. One is associated with a paper of the and Schmeidler from 89, but gamma maximum goes back way before in discussions of decision under uncertainty. You have a, a set of, you have a, a, each act is associated with a set of expectations. Look at the worst case region. Worst case region, lowest expectation. Security with regard to expectation. So each act gets identified with one number, namely its worst expectation. And then you pick the best of the worst. You can see right away this is going to produce an order because and it, each act is assigned its own number independent of the context once you define the partition. So it gets assigned its own number or rank the numbers as well. So, so, so there's no problem that this is going to uh, produce an order because every act gets assigned a real number, it's worst expectation, and you compare those numbers, that's an order. It won't obey any cancellation on the parts. That's the problem. Because we know that the, the property of worst expectation is not stable from the mixtures. Maximality. This is, I think, uh, I, I associate this with. So, yeah, and this will be an example of alpha and gamma, but not data. So, admissible choices are those that are undominated in expectation by any single alternative. So, we do pairwise comparisons. And an option is allowed if there's nothing that dominates it in expectations, always has a higher expectation. So we'll, I'll go back to the picture to show you this is not equivalent to choosing phase under some conditions it is, but it is. So again, this is pairwise. You're saying I have an option, look at any competitor, do the head-to-head -head competition, pairwise competition is the one always getting a higher expectation than the other. If it is the one with lower expectations, it is the Otherwise, if they're crossing or tied, they're both admissible. And an option is admissible unless something beats it, unless something is definitively better. And 
that is not based because H was never best, but there was no one thing that beat it in the example I gave you. Sometimes it was F, sometimes it was G. So it would pass maximality in that three-way twist. EU admissibility, which I associate with I, Isaac, but I, 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 I prowled Savage, fake, Savage's book enough. I can show you a decision problem called binary state state, binary decision problem for Savage's. Is the only explanation I can give for Savage's analysis is E admissibility. He's worried about sets of probability. So I think uh, Savage was inclined. If, I mean, either you're saying he's being sloppy, which I'm not likely to endorse with Savage, or else I'm saying he's actually endorsing the admissibility. Right? We can do the close text and out, very careful text. It's like good little studies. We open the book and we see the lines and say, what could this might mean? I'm saying Savage has given at least one example associated with the picture on the cover of the Wiley book. So it's a picture on the book. So, so it's not an incidental example that made it to the cover. Uh, so this is Bayes' model that it maximizes expected utility for some probability in the set P. I'm putting convex in parentheses because Isaac always endorsed convex sets and only those, and he and I never made resolution on our disagreements that I think the decision theory should not be restricted to convex. Now, each theory has expected utility as a special case for the probability single, so they reduce to the same theory. Um, so this is a very simple question, but these are now all choices that are admissible. So can't be, um, can't, like, to, like, I guess I can't choose among the admissible choices. I'm sorry, I'm not. I can't choose among all the admissible choices, because I, I think that there's more than one, so they based on this other set of four. Yeah, we have to choose the most admissible ones, and here we, there are further flavors, of there may be more than one maximum one. And the question is how you choose amongst those. We can look at refinements. I, I would give, for the case of the admissibility, I think a very nice example of how to answer your question is Isaac's proposal, which is you have a lexicographic second tier of rules like maximizing security. First thing is be basic. Well, I'll give you a reason why I think it's right to do that as a first tier rather than changing the order of priorities. Second tier, say maximize security. Amongst the base. So use it as a lexicographic. So I do this first, and then the ones that survive get subjected to the second round of tests. And the question is, okay, if we want to do this, what order should we subject these ideas to? And I think Isaac's approach to use fan base first and security second is better than other approaches. But yes, you're exactly right. We could, and it's appropriate question saying, fine, you've given me a partial solution to the problem. What do I do now? I'm not saying these are indifferent. It's not like I say they're all equally good. They're not transitive. Okay. So here's in terms of some of the axioms I've described. Gamma maximum produces a real value of ordering of options. You're assigning to every option a real number, so we're expecting stability, number. And hence it's defined by bi binary comparisons, which is comparing the numbers to know which one's better, but it fails independence cancellation of common parts. It won't obey, it won't obey, uh, 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 it will allow the Ellsberg choices. Because if it didn't and it obeys ordering, it's almost expected utility. And no expected utility doesn't allow Ellsberg choices. Maximality it doesn't generate an order. It satisfies alpha, it satisfies gamma, but not beta, because A and B may be both admissible in a pairwise choice, and B and C may be both admissible in a pairwise choice, but A and C may have only one maximum. I'll draw a picture of that. It's not mysterious. What's going on. Binary states, two, two states are sufficient for A, B, C. Uh, you'll see that um, uh, in a uh, B and C in a pairwise choice B and C are uh, both uh, maximal because neither dominates the other. Uh, whoops, picture is yeah. A and C in a pairwise choice are both maximal because neither dominates the other. But in a pairwise choice between A and B, only B is maximal. So it's not transitive. 
the uh, admissibility is not transitive. So it's, it's not, uh, 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 the preference is not, though it's given by a binary, it's not given by uh, an order of options. Do you like a different example or is uh, we'll see what you're doing. Oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, let me put it up. So uh, this is important enough. So maximality of our decision rule, you look at, you say, is C maximal? Is there anything that's better than C? That's a binary comparison. No, there's no option that lives above C in the surface of expected utilities. Uh, how about B? Is B maximal? Um, uh, well, um, uh, amongst the three, there's nothing that lives above B. How about A? No, A is not maximal. B lives above A. Okay, so we know in the three-way choice, the maximal solutions are B and C. We don't know how to choose between B and C, but we know it's not A. However, in the pairwise choices, uh, any, in each pairwise choice of the three pairwise choices, A, uh, excuse me, uh, of the pairwise choice with C, uh, a and C both are maximal, B and C are both maximal, but that doesn't provide transit. Okay. Do you have a different example that brings out something? Okay. That illustrates alpha and gamma. It's given by pairwise comparisons. It doesn't satisfy beta. It does satisfy alpha. If something is inadmissible in a small set, there's something already in the small set that beats it, expand it. But the small set is still there in the larger set, so it doesn't, doesn't violate alpha. So there's alpha, and there's gamma, not beta. Either. Joke complete. Any questions? I may have done that too fast. If you've not seen these alpha beta gamma principles, it sounds very much worth saying. I have a question about the gamma mixing. I think that's a little white. I didn't prove that yet, but I'm giving you. Um, I'm pointing to phenomena we've seen already that the lower value of an act, when A and B can have such that A is lower than B in its lowest form. But when I mix with C, A jumps, the mixture of A with C jumps above the mixture of B with C. It's related to in the stylation front, all that blends together. So that maybe one of the other more, more experienced people have a good, you have a good example of that here? Yeah. But I mean, it comes completely broken out. It's like Ellsberg phenomena. Mixtures of things that have low expectations may have high expectations. I'll show that. Yeah, in fact, we're about to look at an example, but that, why am I making It's not mysterious. So let's go through our decision rules with just the three options before we do any further convex. Yeah, I was going to. Thanks, I was just getting the screen down. Thank you all. So if we go back to our three-way choice FGH, then the gamma maxims, maximum solution amongst this triple is H alone and maximize minimum expectation. The e admissible solution is just the base solutions, the two reds so, as FG, and maximality all three. So you could have a simpler example to show the two rules. We'll take you to different you know, Simple enough. So they're all different decisions. This is in the general case where I haven't put further constraints on the menu. The natural move to try and uh, restrict the menus is to say, let me at least give myself an strategy. I have points I can flip and I can take mixtures of strategies. Certainly, if you're doing game theory, you want to mixtures and mixed strategies. And mixed strategies behave very differently in this case. Why? For example, what's the mixture of F and G 50 50? I'll flip a coin. The lands tails, I'll play F, and the lands tails, I'll play G. What is the graph of the 50 50 mixture of F and G? Well, it's all linear expectation. So if you tell me, uh, what the value of the strategy is under omega one and what the value of the strategy is under omega two, I'll know it's the straight line connecting them. That's the graph of the expected utility. So under omega one, what's the 50-50 mixture of F and G? Well, it's a half one plus a half zero, it's a half. So it we'll pop up a little bit above H on the left. What's the 50-50 mixture of, omega, uh, of F and G under omega two? It's a half zero and a half one. 
so it's a half. So the 50-50 mixture of F and G graphs as the straight line sitting parallel, of course, to H up at 25. So even though F and G have poor security, their mixed strategy has marvelous security. And also is day is exactly at one point, the 50-50 point. So it squeaks in as Bayes, but only if P a half is in your picture. So I'll draw that we have this picture later on, but you can see already what's happening. And this is why uh, uh, gamma maximum is not uh, going to satisfy the independence. Of course, H is better than F, H is better than G, H is not better than the 50-50 mixture of F and G. H is worse than the 50-50 mixture, high securities, because the 50-50 mixture of F and G is the constant function of 0.5, which beats H. And that would be enough to get a violation of the points. Okay, let me move on to see where we're going. So this shows you what I was just saying. If you now convexify the space, I said, give me all the strategies. The mixed strategies that come with F and G are all the straight lines that fill up. They're, they pivot through the common point of intersection, and they are the straight lines with different slopes that fill up the pink region. If I'm limiting myself to the probabilities between 2, 5, and 7, 5. So if I have F and G in mixed strategies, I can get any straight line going through that point. Uh, inside the pink region. And of course, M, that mixture 50-50 is a maximizer of security. So if I chose M, I get, uh, I get maximality from this set because nothing beats it. I also get maximizing security because nothing has a better security. Everything else is going to dip down below a half somewhere. So these are the kinds of decision rules I think you want to look at. I think it's legitimate to worry about security. That's the whole point of Ellsberg. So you would like somehow security to play a role in your story. The question is how do you solve it? I don't think you want just security. I don't think you want to avoid security considerations, but how to fold it in. So one way is, is here. You could do maximality following by security, that would do it. I don't know, Gert, have you ever looked at rules that? Yeah, Well, if you want to get the game theorists, you should get the game theorists. They're just like they need security. You know, they need their company. Thanks. If we're interested in security, what do you think about like risk averse So now we're using jargon, right? Uh, just a view that says that uh, one dollar assuming I value money linearly, uh, I would just prefer the 50 50 coin best that gives me a dollar for heads, lose the dollar for tails. Always have a traditional. So the utility functions that will, will, uh, will not have a constant uh, utility for money. You can't say that and say my utility for money is constantly concave down. Right? Well, I guess some people think that you can have uh, linear utilities for money uh, and then you can uh, value the uh, risk itself. Like part of your stuff. Yeah, but right. now we're violating. Yeah, that's right. So she has like restricted from one time. Yeah. So, so I was trying to understand. Yeah. yeah. So we're giving, we're moving away. I thought for a moment we were trying to model this all with respect to security. No, I, I guess I'm just wondering uh, about the motivation for a view that cares about security in the ambiguous case. Uh, but disregards uh, security in the uh, non ambiguous case. The irony here is more security doesn't depend on the security. Yeah, it does not. Yeah, sorry, I think, I think both uh, ways of being asymmetric are strange. Okay. So, but, but I'm just wondering because, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you, I guess, not so <laughs> Um, so uh, I'm uncomfortable. I mean, okay, now you're pressing me for how I wander through this minefield of different decision theories. And uh, I'm uncomfortable, and I'll tell you why, with decision theories that are in the defenses. I have several reasons why, some of which I've written off in the high theory, but consequences. 
<laughs> but let me say that I, I like, as I said, I'm Bayesian. And you, you, know, you cut me open and you check all this on on deep. It's going to look pretty Bayesian. I mean, after all, I work with Jake today. He's the Leonard Savage professor. You can't get more Bayesian than Leonard Savage. So, uh, so um, I, I would like theories that hold on to independence. I'm much more comfortable with doing that. And Laura's theory is a kind of gives up independence. So, so. so. Well, let me go through what we're supposed to go through before. You shine the back, uh, uh, you shine the back, which is the debate between giving up order and giving up independence. And I have that. They come out and follow this question. I think the theories that hold on to require you to make unsatisfactory sequential decisions. I'll leave it at that. That doesn't mean any old theory that gives up order and holds on to independence is okay, but I'm saying that the ones that give up independence and hold on to order are committed to making weird decisions. I'm sad. I would say unsatisfactory decisions. And sequential decisions, not static decisions. Okay. Uh, okay, so this example allows us to see when the three rules can come together in the, the sense that at least the gamma maximum solution is Bayes now. That's because the gamma maximum in this will be M, and that's Bayes, but just Bayes at the real bottom. That's the only place it's Bayes. Everything else, it's not Bayes. That's because an average can't be better than the best. And maximizing expected utility says the best. So the only time an average can be uh, best is when the components are average and they can be good. Because otherwise, one's better than the other. The average is not best. Same problem for big strategies. Um, so M is uh, just Bayes. There's one and only one probability that makes it Bayes. But if that's enough to pass muster, if that's enough to get you into heaven, Got it right for one, then you can win on the second tier because you have the maximizing security. Everyone see what I'm getting at? <clears throat> so, next slide. The decision rules having at least agreeing that what they want are base solutions, maybe not all the base solutions, but at least limiting themselves to base solutions, is reported in, uh, for the following cases by Peter Wally and uh, Mark, Jay, and I, and Isaac. Uh, did a slight generalization. So let me, if the option set is convex, so if the if you've mixed all, if you've got uh, an option set that's convex, by that I mean all the mixed strategies are in, and you're dealing with a convex uh, set of probabilities that is closed, so the boundary is taken care of that way. Uh, or, and now this is the part, the, uh, option, the set of probabilities open and the option set is finitely generated. That's a little piece that we tacked on. Then E admissibility and maximality give exactly the same solution sets. And that the gamma min acts are a proper subset of those. So under those conditions, pairwise comparisons actually suffice. Because we know the pairwise comparisons are sufficient for maximality. However, otherwise that uh, maximality may be involved some inadmissible options. And I'll give you examples of where that is. So this is the kind of best I could do for wrapping my hands around all three and say, well, if we're in one of these cases, we're all going to agree, no matter which, however we're putting together maximality, security, base, we're all going to agree that we want to limit ourselves to a base solution. Which one? Maybe not. But at least we're limiting ourselves to base solutions. And that, I'm basing the part, so I'm saying, okay, so it's a finite amount of space, and this is the family type, we can, we can handle that. Yes? Uh, this is not an important question, but does the E in E invisibility, does it stand for expectations? Yes, it does. Uh, what does the gamma stand for? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, so uh, that's a good question. How did it cut to be called gamma maximum? Do you know what the gamma is? The question is, what is gamma and why is it called gamma maximum? Gamma 
maximum over over outcomes probably. Yeah, so the idea is that you're taking maximums over a restricted set of probabilities, not all sets. But I don't remember why gamma was chosen for that. It's just us a, a set of, but typically it will be a convex set of Okay. Now, I said I wanted to emphasize dominance related things. That's why I started with this one this morning. And I want to say there's no accident uh, involving base admissibility and dominance. That is, none of these decision theories wants to violate dominance. And, the question, and, and they find out in these broad range settings that they're limiting themselves to some collection of bases. Why is that? So this is a theorem due to Pierce in 84. At least it's a, it has precursors in the statistical literature going back maybe about 20 years. Uh, it's a result, well, I'll let me report the result and I'll tell you what's nice about how it's easily proven or not so, the proof is not so hard. So suppose we have a decision problem under uncertainty. One of my charts rows are options, call of your states, you're uncertain about the state. And suppose you have finitely many states and an option space that has mixtures involving um, uh, uh, Finitely many options. So I'm keeping everything finite. We'll talk about intimate generalizations in a moment because there's a question of what you'll tolerate for generalizing. And let's suppose that the outcome space, those little O's, can be represented by a cardinal utility function. So I can sign the numbers in accord with cardinal utility functions. Much like in game theory, when I assume that the numbers are cardinal because I need that for assessing the strategies. So if I have an option which is, fails to be Bayes admissible, suppose you're looking at a decision rule in this setting. You say it's okay to choose this option with low, but little o is never Bayes. Never touches the surface of maximizing expected utility for any probability at all. Then the theorem says there is another option already available to you that uniformly dominates it. So in that sense, uniform dominance in this setting, which is the dissonant coherence, basically compels you in the setting of these kind of structural assumptions to generate only base solutions as admissible. Anything you generate is admissible that's not based on the violent dominance, or something else that is strictly better. So, this I take to be the best I can do to generalize dissonant intuition beyond the particular games of pricing them. Take any decision. As long as you can formulate a cardinal utility for the outcomes, it doesn't have to be linear money, any cardinal. And you have this uh, restriction to um, uh, finite decisions and finitely generated uh, 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 option set, finite state space. Then, if you have an option which has no base solution, no matter what the probability, it never maximizes the expected utility in your set. And there's something else that dominates it. That's I take the, the best I can do to give you a general version of this. If any is proving that for special decision problems called these pricing things. But it's not limited to the pricing Anything of this form. And the mixed strategies in if is come formally from allowing the second player to choose different weights for the gammas. The gammas play the role of the values of the mixed strategy. You say, how much of my wealth do I have? Do I want to apportion to different strategies? Normalize that so your total wealth is called one in that of that, uh, basically the mixed strategy of the sign. No, it's more than that. It's got to obey properties of mixture. So it's the mixture of 0.5 and 0.4 between 0.5 and 0.4 other weights. That's if I say one of the values of 50 50 mixture of an outcome worth zero, an outcome worth zero, it's going to be 0.5. But these are part of the values. So if an enemy was assuming the monetary value was the total value, it was using minimum utility. This result says it doesn't have to be linear utility, just so long as you have a part of the utility that can represent the outcomes. So it's, it's a plot of the Weinstein relation to the progression some I don't know, just like the one who choose the 
Okay, so no, no. So the problem is why the, the reason I chose in these cases is 0505 is security maximized. I put the security maximized e to be 0505 depends on the scale of the payment. I was building in enough symmetry that that way. And of course, um, there is a connection between um, entropy maximization and gamma maximization. That's a paper by uh, uh, Peter Grunwald and Peter and who else? Peter and Phil. David. Phil is it Phil, Phil? Peter and Phil? Yeah. Yeah. They were they were showing a connection between important connection between. Uh, down maximum and entropy or maximization. Not down, uh, down maximum entropy. Yes. Um, can you explain again why the resource team is uniform dominance? Oh, if it's a finite state space, then dominance is uniform dominance. Okay, so, that's so that's, that's in parentheses because the question is what happens when we try and generalize state space? But if I have only a finite state space and A is always better than B column, then it's all there's the closest it gets, and that closest amount is the epsilon for uniform dominance. That's in some states it may be better by a lot, in other states by a little, but if it's a finite number of states, there's a minimum amount that's better than and that's the uniform dominance. The uniform dominance only comes into question when I do state space. Do I get uniform dominance or just some dominance? And it turns out you can actually get the uniform dominance. By, well, it depends how you generalize the result. Okay. Where am I on time? It's uh, 2.57, and we go until 3.30. Okay. So I think I don't have to skip anything yet. So that, that is the setup for why I want to restrict myself to base solutions. And now the question is, what's this concern about phase being non-binary, and uh, uh, how do I take advantage of it? So let me tell you where we're going, at least in this. I want to show you that you can characterize choice functions so they get back base solutions in this IP setting, and uh, the choice functions are such that they are as behaviorally, they will distinguish the behavior maximally in the sense that each two sets of probabilities has its own set of choice functions when we look at even finite decision functions. It has different footprints about how it represents decisions. And the question is okay, so why would I want such extreme flexibility? Why do I care about arbitrary sets of probabilities? In the mathematical point, but how much of this is actually going to be used? When am I going to look at non convex sets, let alone disconnected sets? Uh, so I'll give you an example in here where at least I can motivate the concern for non convex sets. And non convex sets won't be given by binary comparisons. So you need to at least take advantage of the theory of choice functions. And why do I want to use the non convex sets? I'll give away, and this is the picture that Gert, Gert uh, was showing. I have a 3D version of this, which I wasn't able to bring. Let me just skip down and I'll show you the picture that we're headed towards. Okay, that's the picture we're headed towards. Let me show you where we're going. Let me take a look at this. So, um, Gert was discussing simplicities for representing sets of probability. <laughs> So these are uh, uh, sets in the real RN space, which have extreme points at the, so, so the coordinates correspond to elements of a partition. So if I've got uh, four elements of a partition here, omega one, omega two, omega three, that's my state space. Then uh, the set of probabilities on four atoms is a three-dimensional object because they're subject to the restriction that the sum of the probabilities is one. So three degrees of freedom. In the case of uh, two atoms, you have a, the range of the line connecting from zero to one, so it's got one degree of freedom. In the case of three atoms, it would just be a flat triangle. The reason we're headed up to this is, I, this is the smallest space that allows you to cover atoms with the 
two atoms and two atoms. So four atoms. So the space of four of probabilities on four atoms is the tetrahedron, the pyramid, where each coordinate is an extreme point in the probability space. So this puts all its probability on omega one, this on omega two. To ignore the other core, the other the other um, uh, notation about the a's and the s's. That's related to an example. So and now you can ask: Once I've got the four atoms, I can make them into a two by two table in three ways. So that is, I can group the atoms. So now we're into discussing two by two tables. I think. Most of what's important in statistics can be thought of two by two cases. I'm not a lot of data set now. So um, I want to make them events, rows, and columns. Well, just for sake of discussion, when you have four atoms, you can make three pairs of events. This would be omega one, omega two as A, and omega three, omega four as A complement, and then the orthogonal omega one, omega three, and omega two, omega four. That would give us the columns. But there's another pair of events which we've already encountered. They're the diagonal events: omega one, omega four, omega three, omega two. So if, if it's A and B, then there's a third pair of events C, and any two of them allow you to form a two by two table. So you have three different two by two. I'm looking here at a particular pair, omega one, omega two is A, omega three, omega four is A complement, and then the columns that way. And when you do that, you can ask, what's the set of distributions that make A and B independent? It's the probability of A and B equals probability A times probability B. Independence is very important statistical concept. On one side will be the events in which the two events are positively correlated, that is the probability of B given A is higher than the probability of B at one point seven, and then the other they're negatively correlated. So it divides the surface into three regions: positive correlation, negative correlation, and dependence. If you're doing causal inference, this is the kind of surface you worry about. You want to know whether these are factors that are living on the surface. What does the surface of independence look like? It's like a satellite. It's a hyperbolic surface. Look at the form of the equation: P A B equals P A B. P of A times P of B equals P A B, X, Y equals Z. It's hyperbolic. Hyperbolic surfaces are non convex. They have convex subregions, but they're not convex. If you look at the picture, you can see the saddle. Take two points, connect them, and you're off the saddle almost immediately, but immediately, unless you happen to be on special linear subsurfaces. So that means if I'm if I would like to say events A and B are independent, I have an IP model, and I'm stuck with convex sets, can't do it unless I have to be living on one of these very special convex linear rulings. In general, if A and B has uncertainty, if A, if the rows have some uncertainty and the columns have uncertainty in the IP sense, not single things, then the surface of independence is not convex enough. So it's got enough curvature, it's pretty on the south. So I would like a decision theory that respects the fact that I want to have as a constraint that A and B are independent. Can't do that with binary comparison. Cannot do it. Binary comparisons can tell convex representations. So if you want to know why bother you about non-convex choice theory, non-convex representation choice functions, which is where you need to go if you get beyond binary comparisons. Say, are you interested in independent statistical independence? I'm waiting for yes, and then maybe you say yes, and I'll show you this picture. So we'll talk about examples and the importance of the picture. We'll use this picture to talk about the value of information. I'll tie things together. How much time left, Kevin? Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay, so the framework I'm using is I'm going to start with a set of options which are closed. What polynomial is my price convergence? Why? Because if I have a set of options, everyone's subject to this problem. If I have a set of options that are no closed, there may be no invisible option. Think of the choice and uncertainty of a value in a half open interval from zero to one or so forth. Nothing is invisible. Is anything you choose or something? And if you can do self countably out of the mixtures, you're subject to the same problem. Now we'll find out the other. 
But so I'm going to work, from, I'm going to solve that problem by saying we're dealing with both, with both sets of options. So I don't run into the problem of nothing. So we'll under anyone's decision. Okay. Uh, to say an option is a local based model, P, if O maximizes the P expected utility over the options in O. Doesn't have to uniquely, but to say it's based with respect to our set at the value P, the P is in our set, is to say it maximizes expected utility. When I choose the value P from the set of cards, it's local in the sense that it's only this in this decision problem, not saying anything about this. And we know by Pearson's result, if an option O fails to have a local based model at all, it's uniformly dominated by something. So I'm going to be uh, restricting myself to undominated and non-dominated options, which will get me to the base options. So that's why when you cut the open end base inside, I do this. So a choice function is coherent. So let me, this is a new sense of coherence. I mean, skip it, I'm using, I'm abusing the jargon. So a choice function is coherent if there exists some IP set of probabilities such that the acceptable options under C are precisely those that maximize expected P utility for some P in P. And uh, uh, so I'm saying a choice function is coherent if it gives you back the base solutions with respect to the set P. So you let's go back. We've seen this picture several times. M is a base solution precisely if P is in the set. How do I use choice functions to uh, get an arbitrary set? Suppose I say to you, well, in this problem, um, the uh, uh, acceptable solutions are um, F and G, but not M, and not any of the other pink options, because they don't touch the surface of the base. What do you mean don't touch? They touch your P, not if P is not in my set. So I can distinguish a set that has the probability of being in it from a set that doesn't, regardless about convexity, by asking whether M is admissible in this decision problem with F, G, and M. If you say yeah, F is invisible and G is invisible, but not M, I know P is not, P a half is not in your set. And I've just I've shown you how to uh, avoid uh, using convex sets of probabilities, because stuff on the left is of a half is in, stuff on the right of a half is in, but a half is in there. But the set of probabilities is not even connected, but it's not convex. So the theme, the reason I showed this is because this is the core of what's going to take place. I'm not taking the theory. Theory. But the theory is going to work because it allows for saying uh, uh, F is admissible, G is admissible, M is not in the three way choice of F, G, and M. And that's a test for P a half and M. P a half is in your set if and only if M is admissible. If and only if M is admissible. Yes. That's different. That, That's different. These P's are the pro. I'm talking about P of omega when I mean P. Thank you. So I'm assuming I've got mixing available to me of options. I'm saying if you take the mixed set, convex set of options, so all those X's and Y's and alphas. But these P's are the probabilities over the states of uncertainty. And I'm saying if I you give me a choice with F and G and M, F and G, so M is in there. The under mixing. And uh, you say, is M admissible? M will be admissible if and only if P a half is in your set. If and only. Because if P a half is in your set, it goes to the surface and right there at, at the its phase admissible. And if P a half is not in your set, one of F or G beats M in expected utility. So this already shows you that a simple decision rule like this is characteristic of a point P a half. I can tell you whether P a half is in the set without telling you how much above and how much below or what the shape of the stuff looks like. So you can test individual probabilities. You can do that at any place. You can take any sort of set 
and modify it with the probability and construct a variance of the solution of the variable so that you're testing for that point by simulating a certain mixture of the sequence. Those mixtures have this wonderful property that when they're admissible, they're admissible at a very delicate point because they have to be, to, for the mixture to be admissible, the things you're missing, but the mixing must all be simultaneous to maximum. Otherwise, you're bringing the average down. And so you can check by taking advantage of that idea to see whether a specific distribution is in by finding a suitable mixture which is exactly uh, uh, at maximum when all those probabilities, when all the components of that probability, if some of those components are the same, then it's not. Yes. So if you want to check for uh, variance, you have to Basis of another yes, I, I have to change the slopes of the payment, but I can with finite payments change the points of intersection yeah. and with the right slopes so that the critical horizontal going through there is going through exactly the point you want to check. Yeah, and we need to use different pieces strategies. Different, different, make different decision problems, different. It's not different mixed strategies, I have to change the decision problem. So I have to get the lines to intersect. The, the point of intersection of the lines is no longer at a half. I have to have it intersect with, say, a third. You want to know whether P of third is in. So I need this version of the problem where the mixing, po the point where the critical intersection occurs is at a third. So I need the slopes of the lines with different slopes, which means I have to change the height. So I need to switch to a different finite decision problem where those two lines intersect at a third, and then I play the same thing. And it's telling me that I can make a mixture that's constant and going exactly to the third. Tell me whether that mixture is admissible. If it is to your third's intersect, if it's not to your third's not intersect, then I don't have to worry about that. So that's basically in pictures what the choice theory looks like. I mean, you can ask what sort of axioms does it take to get you that, but maybe I won't do that because I want to get you the example. So I'll get to the example about independence by taking advantage of the second theory that I mentioned. I'll go through again. How much time? 15 So I want to do something about interpreting IP as group decision making, which I don't think we've discussed in the length of. But the idea is think of this as a community of canonical Bayesians. Each Bayesian shows up with very his own probability. And we're trying to know how to make a coordinated decision for them. And the question is, what kind of group decision do you want? Uh, I favor ones that try and preserve consensus, but they all agree on we would like to have that preserved in the, in the group decision. And the question is, if you have a bunch of precise Bayesians, can you represent them as some idealized precise Bayesian and preserve what they all agree on? I want to say I want to show you a sense of yes and a sense of no, but a sense of yes. So, um, so the, are there rules for combining a set of n many expert probability distributions into one distribution that preserves what all the agents would agree uniform, uniform, unanimously on, okay, what, or, or what they all, what the consensus that they all have? You want to preserve that with the with the representation of the pooled opinion. Because if the pooled opinion doesn't preserve what there's consensus about, the pooled opinion will say do A, and they're all saying do B or something. So uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the popular decision rules is called linear pooling, and you'll see how this relates to what we're doing in IPs by saying what we'll do is we'll assign each expert's opinion some non-negative weight and average their probabilities. And so we're taking a convex combination of their probabilities with weight summary. They don't have to be equal. And uh, we'll assign for the group that weighted pool. So this is trying to avoid everything IP. The individuals are precise, the groups can be precise. The question is, does the group preserve all the consensus for the individuals? Across the individuals. So the linear pool inside the hull. And if you allow the weights to vary, then you can start to fill up the convex regions and you get convex IP. Or by letting the weights vary. But you're always represented with the elements of the way it happens. So 
So what are the nice features? What parts of the consensus does the linear pool preserve? It's got a lot of pleasant features. So if everyone in the group assigns a provision, precise, remember we're dealing with a bunch of different impacts. So they all have precise probabilities. If they all assign precise probabilities that live between constants C1 and C2 to some event E, then obviously the average of their probabilities will determine that. And so the average will also agree that the price is bigger than, it's not less than C1 and not more than C2. So if they all agree, that a certain gamble is uh, worth less than C1, they'll say the price of P is better than that, and so on and so forth. But the linear pool will preserve all those annuities. Um, similar reasoning is that if each expert judges Act 1 better than Act 2 by the standards of expected utility, then the team will as well. So this is related to maximality. So if, if B beats A for each individual, the weighted average of their opinions will be that. It's computationally convenient and it's local in the sense that in order to sign to find the value, this is a side on computational complexity. I haven't mentioned that before, but it's part of the advertising for linear opinion. So if you want to know what P of G for the group, group opinion for E is, all you need to know are the individual values. PIV, you don't, don't need to know how the experts think about other events or how they, how they divide up P to B, C, B. So it's very local in the sense that once you know the weights and the individual opinions of E, that's all you need to know for computational purposes. You don't need to explore their opinions outside that small set. Very computational. So what's the problem? Learning and pooling. We're back to the value of information. Think you can hint, get sense of the world. This is a linear opinion pool, it's convex operation. Convex operations do not preserve independence. Independent, if information is independent, then by our value of information, for sure it's irrelevant. And for sure it won't change your opinion. So if all the experts think, or so like two experts, two experts they think that events A and B are independent, and the decision is about B. They were all saying learning the experiment for A doesn't give you anything of value because the value of learning A and then and then deciding about decisions involving B will produce exactly the same expected value because A is irrelevant, it doesn't change your opinion. So of course it doesn't change your opinion too. So you would pay zero to learn A in order to decide about B. No, no decision maker would say, let's go run an A experiment so on B if A and B are independent. But if I use a linear pool, I'm going to replace their changes, which may be on the surface. And once I'm off the surface, it means I have dependence between A and B. But once I have dependence between A and B, that means if I learn A and my opinion about the changes, if I the changes not all change my position, and then I have value information. And so if I have a mixture, there will be some decision problem where the relevance of A and B introduced by the linear pool will make it worth to learn A before you decide on the end you'll be willing to pay it, even though the experts say they're irrelevant. So I'm saying that's the violation of consensus, that it's a subtle violation of consensus related to value of information, which I'm saying linear pool does not do. The experts say A is irrelevant information, B is value of the linear pool says, no, 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 maybe that's not. Because it takes you from joint distribution, set of joint distributions that are on the surface, and independence to search distribution off the surface of independence. Once you have dependence, the question is, how much does my opinion change relative to the types of the decision? The change is not making it out of So the example that follows, so, so this, this is the verification that the linear opinion pool doesn't uh, uh, obey what's called external Bayesian, which means that pooling and then learning doesn't commute with learning and pooling. Let's, let's see it that way. So, so consider uh, the opinion that comes by everyone learning F. Well, I can get to it in one of two ways. I can first pool their opinions with a linear pool and then take that one distribution of the five A's rule. 
Or I can share all the information with the individual bases for it's like the individual base up there. That gives me uh, a new set of individual distributions. Pull those with the same base and see what the answer is. Those two answers don't have to be the same. And it's always very special by the base in which the two events in question are independent of the individual base of it. The uh, linear pool is not externally Bayesian. What I'm doing is parlaying the well known result that the external Bayesian pool is not, that the linear pool is not externally Bayesian. I'm still parlaying that into a conflict with value information. But what's critical is that the value of information failure does not reduce the binary, does not reduce the binary comparisons because if it did, it would be something that the, the convex set machine would pick up. So this consensus about value of information is essentially not binary. It's saying the experts are saying, I'll give you the decision policy, but the experts will agree that paying to learn is not acceptable, but they want this not based, but they won't agree on what is based, one which is that, one which is G, and the paying to learn is like on page seven next. And pairwise, you can't show that there's a failure. It's only when you consider all of and the linear pool, in that sense, does not preserve the aspect of the consensus that comes out of value of information when you face a non binary decision. So I think probably the best thing to do is just show you again the picture. So we're going to have events from this rows and columns. I'll tell you the particular, I tried to make it as colorful as my poor imagination. Uh, what we have is two, we have a patient who is either allergic or not allergic to some treatment. And the doctors, the two doctors don't agree. One thinks, given what they know about the patient, it's more probable that the patient is allergic or not, the other one thinks the other way. And let's suppose the divide one. Take a part of it and a lot. Now you may just if A is allergic, if it's more than a half allergic, you have to find a different treatment, if it's less than a half this treatment. S and S prime are two events that both doctors agree is irrelevant to the diagnosis of, uh, the, of the uh of allergic state. It's a, a diagnostic test that each says is trivially irrelevant. Why maybe it has to do with something like the weather in the patient, but uh, yes, I'm sorry, this patient this patient's allergic set has nothing to do. By the way, we disagree about the weather in the I think. So, but we both agree they're independent, but we're now dealing with two points on the surface of independence where they don't agree either on the weather or on the so That's sufficient for putting us into a P1, P2 picture like this. And so any linear pool or any convex combination will put you on a point P3 on the same side of the surface of independence, say it's the positive side. So that would mean that if you use P3, you would say, a and uh, S, S is one of the states, maybe sunny in Beijing. A and S are positively correlated. If I go check the weather in S, it will, and if it's sunny, it will raise my probability for allergic. And if it's uh, not sunny, it will lower it under P3. P3 is justifying the use of this medically irrelevant information. It's usually Both doctors say you're crazy. And they're right to say you're crazy. Because they are, they are trained. The only allowed probability models here are ones which make this irrelevant to A. If you do anything else, you're violating um, judgments, medical judgments. Those medical judgments are not reduced by Thank you. So, what I've got here is a, a, a shaggy dog story to make a little decision problem where if you use the convex combination, you will find probabilities in the convex set, which represents the, first of all, any linear pool, which gives you a precise probability, is going to uh, set you off for this problem of recommending as a diagnostic test. Spend, spend uh, uh, health resources on finding out what the government is. So no precise base model which is a linear pool convex combination, uh, is going to obey the preservation of 
what their shared agreements about the value of information just can't be done. And if you use a convex set of probabilities, you will also then, the extent that you start to look at probabilities that are off the surface, they will make Bayes, because it is Bayes, to use the information in China about the weather in China to make the diagnostic treatment about the allergic state. Of course, they're all using those probabilities. Those probabilities are positively correlated. Only the endpoints make it right. We want a decision theory that says the set of probabilities to represent the consensus between these two is just there to obtain. The guess what? We've got such a decision theory in the case of anything that involves the, the other decision rules is, I'm afraid, going to get us back to convex sets. You might, just to complete the story, you might ask, well, maybe there's some other kind of pooling that doesn't get this problem. The, uh, there's a little impossibility here. Uh, with, uh, I'm skipping the details of the example. It's just, it's just, uh, uh, it's just giving us back the, uh, the results that we see in the picture. Is it clear what I'm complaining about? I'm complaining there's consensus and value of information. Value of information is the base property. It does reduce the binary comparison to the decision rule. That doesn't violate that consensus. You can't do the binary choice. You can do the choice functions. So there, I should be interested. What about consensus about the value of correlation? There's a consensus. But the correlation is in the representative sense, not in the you're talking now about I'm not following what you're saying. You're asking about do they agree? Can I make a parameter how to do this correlation? Yes. But that is in that it's not going to be a, in the space of actions. It's not going to be a comparison of gambles on the space. It's not really good. The only thing you get out of those comparisons of complex sets of probability. We are regularly with trouble with complex sets. Let's ask, let's just complete the impossibility for the Bayesians. Can you find some other way to pull the Bayesians into Bayesian? Well, the, there is a class of rules, Mark, Mark Sherbert helped to identify them, which are external Bayesians. I will preserve the value of information. They are not linear, they are uh, linear in the logs of the probabilities. That is, you take the logs of the probabilities, you weight averages of those, normalize things, those will preserve uh, the value, the, the, the conditional. The problem is they are not convex, so they don't preserve the agreement about unconditional probabilities. They preserve consensus on conditionals, but they don't preserve consensus on unconditional. So, for example, if you had P1 at three events, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, these two have been muted. The first one's the same. And you do W1 equals W, give them equal weights. If you do the logarithmic pool, though they agree on 0.3, the log will change the 0.3 into something else. Because when you normalize it, So you have this little impossibility for pooling. If you want to take a bunch of Bayesians and pool them into a single Bayesian, and if you use the linear pool, you will not preserve value of information. If you use the uh, results related to preserving um, uh, conditional probabilities with the value of information is about. You can do that, but you can't do that with uh, convex rules. It will be uh, this kind of ex uh, logarithmic exponential pooling, and then you won't preserve the unity. So you're caught between. You can either preserve the unconditionals as in the linear pool and sacrifice the value of information. Or you can preserve the conditional probabilities that the value of information on, and then you give up the unanimities in unconditional probabilities. You cannot do both as a Bayesian. So there's no way to take a group of Bayesians and make them into a Bayesian generally and to do a consensus. But you can with sets of probabilities. You don't represent the individual set of individuals by one distribution, you represent them by a set. And if you do the sets in the right way, you can get the value of information. Am I not out of time? Yeah. Uh, so what I'm doing here is trying to um, so what I'm so this is the details of the choice function axioms for but you know you're welcome to explore that very but the most the selling point here is that 
if you want to preserve what the group of individuals agree on collectively, and you recognize valuable information as something they have clear opinions about, as for example, when they say experiment day is not worth a plug nickel marketplace. Right? It's not worth anything to spend a positive value to this decision. And they all agree on that. I think we're going to that. Especially when they back it up with some usable medical theory. So many lines. Yeah. The state you're checking for medically is, is, medic, is irrelevant. And so you want to preserve that independence. You're now in the decision theories that require non convex representation. And you can't do it with IP, but not with binary choice. Uh, and on the way, we also get the following result, which is that you can't deal with just Bayesian decision theory, because Bayesian decision theory works fine for one agent, but doesn't look up to a group of cooperative agents. So you can't replace a group of Bayesian with a single bit of one. That's the schooling problem. So that's, that would be my, my uh, argument for why Bayesian should be a difficult compromise for just finding a Bayesian. They won't be able to preserve the population. It's in that sense, in the spirit of Plato, Plato did this kind of question for justice. What's justice in an individual? What's justice in a cooperator? He said he wants a theory that looks up what it means to be just, for it's just an individual to say for society. What I'm saying is, let's do the same with regard to the notion of rationality. The standards of the rational agent should be the same for an individual and cooperating group. Base theory doesn't survive that test. Savage's theory, if you may see, is not so bad. So, if you just want to be a non Bayesian, a good way of arguing that I think is to say you can't lift up the standards of rationality of individuals and groups, but you can if you relax the Bayesian theory and do something more key based. Let's take a look. 